Well, we are continuing a series today called Blessed Families. And as I mentioned before, this is a series that my pastor, Robert Morris, preached five years ago, right after the Lord began speaking to us about planting a church in Colorado. And as he was preaching this series, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, this is what I want you to take to Colorado. And so today we're gonna be talking about marriage. We're gonna talk about blessed husbands and blessed wives. Last week, we talked about the broken family. And it doesn't matter if you came from a a family where your parents were married or divorced, no matter the situation of the family that you grew up in, we all come from a broken family because we all come from the original family that fell in the Garden of Eden. Next week, we're gonna be talking about blessed sons and daughters. So if there's any parents in the room, this is gonna be a good message for you. And all of us are sons and daughters of somebody. And so this is gonna be a great message for you. But this week, we're talking about marriage. Last week, I said families are under attack. Let me say this, marriage is under attack. Marriage across the world and in our country is under attack. Listen to this, in 1930, 83% of adults in America were married, 83%. In 2015, that number dropped to 50%. And here we find ourselves in 2023, that number has dropped yet again to 46.4%. If you don't think that there is a strategic attack on the families and on marriages, then let me open your eyes today. There is a reason why Satan hates marriage. It's not by coincidence that the marriage rate is decreasing. And it's not by coincidence that the divorce rate is increasing. There is an assignment from the enemy to disrupt families and disrupt marriages, but we serve a God who is faithful and who sits on the throne, amen? So he's got an answer for everything that the enemy wants to come to kill, steal, and destroy. And we're gonna talk about that today. The title of our message today is called The Blessed Marriage. The Blessed Marriage. I invited you last week to open your Bibles and take out your notes because if you believe the Holy Spirit is gonna speak to you, then you wanna capture anything he says. And if you're not taking notes, you might miss something. So I wanna encourage you again to do that today. Well, my wife Jade and I, we, uh, we're coming up on 12 years of marriage and we have two kids and our life is wild right now. And um, over the last several years of marriage, there's, and I'm just gonna joke with you for a minute. There's something that I learned and that is that it seems that 50% of marriage is husbands trying to convince wives why cargo shorts and Crocs are completely acceptable to wear to the mall. Come on, fellas, can I hear you? And, and the other 50% of marriage is wives trying to convince husbands why a major discount at Nordstrom's isn't spending money, it's actually saving money. Come on, ladies. And marriage is trying to understand the other person's perspective. Well, today our reading is gonna come out of Matthew chapter 19, which I believe is one of the most foundational passages in the entire Bible on marriage. Now you may say, well, I thought Ephesians 5 was was the marriage chapter and it's a very important chapter and we will read from that a little bit today. But Matthew 19 is a dialogue between the Pharisees asking Jesus himself about marriage. And it's Jesus's response to the Pharisees about marriage and divorce. And I wanna say in a series like this that if you've experienced divorce, please don't feel condemned. There is no condemnation because we know that God redeems, God restores, God heals, and his grace covers all of us. So whether you're on your first marriage, your second or more, this message is for you. And if you are single in the room, or maybe you've lost a loved one, this message is for you because we are opening up the word of God. And he wants to reveal to us his heart for marriage and what the world knows nothing about. And so it doesn't matter if you're married or if you're not, the world needs to learn what we're about to read today, amen? So we're gonna read out of of Matthew 19 and we're gonna start in verse three. And I wanna say that I don't think most people understand the importance of marriage. We just don't understand it. We, We grow up in a culture that has something to say about marriage. But if you ask a lot of millennials and Gen Z, they would say, well, you know, marriage is optional. In in fact, I I can speak to some of the millennials in the room because I'm a millennial. 
And we grew up in a time where uh, the, the margin of marriages ending in divorce crept up to 50%. So a lot of my peers and maybe your peers as well grew up in a home and statistically, you probably had a divorced family. And so growing up in that, the perspective can be, well, I don't know if I wanna go through that because I watched my mom cry through such a difficult season. I watched my dad struggle through such a difficult season. And so the next generation is coming up and saying, I don't know if I want any part of that. And then the enemy will come in and sprinkle a thought. Marriage is unnecessary. There's no point. Marriage is nothing about uh, getting what you can get. It's all about sacrifice and you don't want to sacrifice because they're going to walk out on you. But I want want us to hear what God says about marriage. Matthew 19, three. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, I underline testing because this is, a, this is a setup. Maybe you're familiar with some other passages like Matthew 16, where the Pharisees are testing Jesus and they're asking for a sign from heaven. Or in Matthew 22, the Pharisees are asking Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes? Or when they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? So they're posing this question not with a heart to learn, they're posing this question to set Jesus up. Because based on the answer that he gives, they might be able to imprison him, to arrest him, and and to, uh, to conclude that he has blasphemed God. So watch as Jesus answers this question. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now, I want you to see something real quick because this is what Jesus is saying. That God created them male and female, male and female, and the two become one. The two become one flesh. So this word joined, it literally means yoked. And in an agricultural society, a yoke is what you would put on two animals that were going to be uh, doing work together or like oxen in a field that are plowing the field. You would get oxen of the same size, the same speed and strength, and you would yoke them together so that as they were moving, they would move in a straight line. Come on, you, you get one that's all jacked up and on roids and you get the other one that's just a baby and they're gonna go in a circle. And so the language here is that God has joined male and female together. He's yoked them. And let me say this, equally, equally yoked them together. Verse six, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So they're wanting to know this answer from Jesus. Is it lawful? Is it lawful? for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason. It's a trap. They're trying to set him up. And here's what Jesus is essentially saying. Let no person in the entire world separate what God has joined together. Is that clear? Let no one separate. Verse seven. So this is uh, the second question they ask. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Let me say this, that in every divorce, there is at least one person with a hard heart. Sometimes there's two, but usually it's just one because of the hardness of their hearts. Now, the context that the Pharisees are referencing here when they said, then why did Moses command? Here's the context. What was happening is that men who were married were neglecting their original wives, marrying other women, neglecting them, withholding from them, mistreating them, and they were trapped. 
because it was unlawful for a woman to divorce her husband. And so these women were trapped. And so Moses comes along and he gives this command. And he says, because the hardness of your hearts, you can divorce her, watch this, send her away with a certificate of divorce so that maybe another man who will treat her like the daughter of God that she is will step into the gap and marry her and treat her the way that you were supposed to. That's why. And so here the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus and he's saying, you don't even know. You think that Moses was just allowing this because it was the thing to do. No, it was because your heart was hard. So it was permitted. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now I want you to see something here because most of the time we would think that uh, under the law, things would be more strict and rigid. And under grace, there would be more freedom. In fact, throughout scripture, Moses is often referenced as representing the law and Jesus represents grace. Let me show it to you in John 1.17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the Pharisees are asking Jesus, is it lawful? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Under the law, yes. Under grace, no. And that's quite surprising to us because we would think, well, Jesus is, is all gracious and all loving, but he's saying, hey, what God joined together, let no one separate. And so the grace message is, hey, work it out, stay together, trust that God himself will step into your situation, invite God into it and work it out. And I understand that there are many situations represented in the room today where you're saying, man, I tried that and the other person left. Man, I, I, I prayed, I got on my knees, I fasted, I went to counseling, I did all that I can do. And I wanna tell you today, there always takes two parts. And so you may have done all you can do and that's what you're held accountable to. So if you have a spouse who walked out on you, who neglected you, who would not be willing to submit the marriage under the lordship of Jesus, there's grace. And so God wants to redeem and restore what you lost. And maybe if you're on the other side where you're like, you know what, I was fed up. I didn't like the way he treated me. I didn't like the way that, that she uh, focused too much on our kids or he focused too much on the business or whatever, and you walked out. I wanna tell you there's no condemnation. That for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, there is grace, there is forgiveness, but let's not do it again. Let's get the word of God in our hearts so that the next time we'll make a redemptive decision and we'll do things God's way, amen? Amen. So why does God not want divorce? Why does God not want divorce? Well, here's the thing about divorce. Nobody ever wins. Nobody ever wins in a divorce. Maybe somebody gets hurt a little less, but nobody ever wins. And if you have children, can I tell you this? They always get hurt. They always get hurt. I grew up in a home where my uh, biological parents got divorced. My wife grew up in a home where her parents got divorced. I have a set of grandparents and they got divorced. Great grandparents and they got divorced. There is divorce that's plaguing our society. And, and we don't have to continue that. And it doesn't matter what your past looked like. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a home where that's all you ever saw. But today we can say, I'm gonna do marriage God's way. I may have blown it on my first three marriages, but today I'm gonna get the word of God in my heart and I'm gonna do it right. So Jesus, he hates divorce because people get hurt. People get hurt. That's why he says, have you not read that for this reason, God created them male and female. There is a blessing that God wanted to bring onto earth and it comes in marriage. And yet the Pharisees said, hey, can we divorce? They're looking at how can we just break this thing that's just not working? And Jesus is saying, there's a plan for you. So what reason is Jesus referring to when he says, for this reason? Well, I wanna tell you three things today that uh, speak to having a blessed marriage. And the first one is this, marriage represents God. 
Marriage represents God. Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now notice the language here. This is plural language. Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion, them, male and female. So from the very beginning in the heart of God, he chose to imprint into the world an image of what he looks like. And that image is male and female. So come on, ladies, if you think, if, if you've ever heard a man say, I'm, in, I'm made in the image of God, I'm made in the image of God, male and female are made in the image of God. So don't let anybody pull something by you. God made us in his image, male and female. When God wanted to create a portrait of himself on the earth, he created marriage. So Satan hates marriage so much because it represents to the world who God is. See, Satan doesn't stand a chance attacking God. Satan is a created being, God is creator. So Satan cannot disrupt what God is doing, but he can disrupt you. He can disrupt me. Satan did not attack Adam. Satan waited until the image of God was on the earth. He waited until male and female were on the earth and that's when he attacked. He cannot stand the image of God so he convinces us that marriage can look many ways. Sound familiar? He convinces us, he makes us believe wholeheartedly that marriage isn't important. That, well, we can live together before we're married. That, well, you could just pick whoever you want. Marriage represents God and Satan wants to distort that. If he can distort marriage, then he can distort our view of God. And right now, if you look at marriage in our world, oftentimes you can't see God at all. In fact, a lot of people don't even realize that God instituted marriage. We think that it's just a union or some sort of ceremony and so we can just kind of bypass certain things. Oh, well, that's tradition, that's not important. We're gonna get to this about covenant and marriage, but God is very serious and very strategic when establishing marriage. So God is triune, we know this from scripture. We have the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And he's created marriage to be the same. Now you may say, I thought marriage was male and female, and that's two. And that's where you're wrong. Marriage is actually male, female, and God. And when you get God into your marriage and you represent the Trinity, then the blessing of God comes on your life. And so if we're not careful, we will go through life, go through marriage, pursuing our spouse and neglecting our relationship with God and wondering why we don't have a blessed marriage. We have to invite the one who created marriage into our marriage to receive the blessing. Now, what about people who aren't married? We're gonna get to that in a minute, but I wanna say this. Jesus was the perfect image of God and he was single for 33 years. So Jesus never got married and the Bible says that he was the perfect image of God. And so you may be in a place right now where marriage is not on the radar, where maybe marriage was a season behind you and that's okay because Jesus is who our ultimate goal is to chase after. It's not a person. Marriage is not the pinnacle of this life, but becoming more and more like Jesus should be the goal for all of us as believers. Now, I wanna share with you a story uh, because when I called my mom when I was 19, I let her know that I met a woman named Jade and I think she's the one. Now, I probably said that same phrase when I was like 12 and maybe 14 and maybe 16. You know, we're looking for the one. But Jade was it. And um, so my mom told me, she said, your dad and I actually knew all along that you were gonna get married young. And I was like, really? How so? And my mom reminded me that when I was in elementary school, I had just a knack for buying and selling things and hustling some of my peers. And so I was um, actually getting money from selling treats in, in my school and I was buying jewelry for my girlfriends. I was just trying to give flowers. I was trying to give jewelry. I loved love. I just, I loved it. And, uh, but my mom said that there was this particular time where when I was in middle school, um, I made a special request for a gift that I wanted my parents to buy me. 
And I'm gonna hold that gift up today uh, because maybe some of you might have this in your CD collection. So this is what I call slow motion, disc one and disc two. Disc, disc two is at home in my CD player, don't judge me. Slow motion. So I remember watching TV late at night, be careful. I was watching TV late at night and an info commercial came on about slow motion and some of the top R&B songs of the late 90s. And here I am at 14, 15 years old, soaking this up. So I thought, I talked to the guys in the back. I said, hey, do you you think we could pull this off? I'm curious if maybe you've heard some of these songs. So I'm gonna have these guys play the first one real quick. Let me tell you, let me hear if you you heard it before. So just imagine 14-year-old Matt jamming to this as I'm going to sleep at night. I am thinking about love. I'm thinking about relationships. I was texting Jono about some of the songs off this CD. And I was like, man, have you heard of these? I need to see if this is gonna land with the room. And what he told me was, man, you start playing some 90s R&B and we're gonna explode our children's ministry upstairs. Come on, come on. So some of you, you're looking for tips and tricks like, hold on, it's, it's been a while, Pastor Matt, I don't know. Uh, slow motion, I think it's still for sale, but you can get it on Spotify. I got another song. Let me, let me see if any of you have heard the second one. Come on, sing it if you know it. Oh, yeah. Is there anybody in the room who doesn't know Boys to Men? I'm about to bless your life. Boys to men, classic. Okay, how about this next one? This just takes me back. I had been working on these moves for years, so I met Jade and I'm like, come on, you don't even know what's about to happen. Now, for some of you that don't know this, I grew up in a home where my mom was white and my dad was black. And so you may notice that this music doesn't fit the genre that you're used to listening to. This is called 90s R&B. Check it out. All right. If you need any other notes, here's the last song. Tell me if you've heard it. You're like a dream come true. Just want to be with you. Girl, it's plain to see. Then you're the only one. Come on, Brian McKnight, let's go. I love love. And so I had this idea of marriage even as a little kid and I didn't wanna play games. So I've shared this story before. I met Jade when I was 19. We met January 18, 2011. By February 14, Valentine's Day, and I'm gonna share about that in a little bit. I knew that she was the one. By March, I asked her to be my girlfriend. By July, I proposed and we got married the next March. I was not gonna waste any time. So some of you guys, you've been, you've been dabbling a little bit. You're not sure. Hey, just seal the deal, make it happen. Have the Lord bless it. Do it the right way and get some 90s R&B in your life. It'll bless you. All right, we gotta get back to the message. That was just ha- us having fun. All right, point number two with a blessed marriage. Marriage represents Christ and the church. This is why marriage is so important. It represents God and it represents Christ and the church. Watch these three words that Ephesians 5 starts out with. Uh, in, In verse 31, for this reason, this is the same language in Matthew 19 from Genesis 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, be glued to his wife and the two shall become one. He's no longer joined to his parents. He is no longer joined to his high school buddies. He is no longer joined to that fraternity that he was in for two semesters. He is joined to his wife. Come on, ladies, you're nudging somebody right now. You're like, come on, you've been joined to so many different things. It's time, it's time, it's all me. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular So love his own wife as himself. He's talking to the husbands and now he's gonna talk to the wives. And let the wife see 
that she represents, that she respects her husband. Together, we're representing the Trinity, male and female and God. But husbands, you are representing Christ. Wives, you are representing the church. And so husbands, let me, let me talk to you just for a minute, a minute here. Husbands, the way that you treat your wives shows the world and your kids how Jesus would treat us, how God would treat us. And fellas, let me just say this. Sometimes we can get into the busyness of life. We can get into 16, 17 year old versions of ourselves where we just become selfish, where we just want things done for us. And can I tell you, that's not marriage. And that is not Christ. And so if you ever wonder, maybe you didn't have a good dad growing up modeling for your marriage, Jesus is the model for us. So practically, how does this look? Let's say you've got an eight-year-old son and your son comes up to you and says, hey, daddy, I know we've been going to that church and we've been learning about God and Jesus, but daddy, I don't know if I, if I accept Jesus, if I say yes to letting him be the Lord of my life, how is he gonna treat me? How is he gonna love me, daddy? And dads, you have an opportunity to say this. Well, buddy, let me tell you, you know the way that I talk to your mom? You know the way that I treat mommy? That is how Jesus is gonna treat you. Do you wanna accept Jesus? And this puts you in a situation where the child is going to say, oh yes, daddy, I love how much you treat mommy, how, how great you treat mommy. I can tell that you love her. I can tell that she means the world to you. Yes, daddy, I wanna accept Jesus. Or is he gonna say, not a chance. Daddy, I watched how you rolled her, your eyes when she asked you to get the groceries from the back of the car. Daddy, I watched how you got mad at mommy for seemingly nothing. Daddy, I saw how you lost your temper. Daddy, I saw how you stayed late at work day after day after day. I don't know if I wanna accept Jesus because I don't know that I want that kind of relationship. Now, ladies in the room, the way that you treat your husband shows the world and your children how Christ, how, how the church views Christ, how we can relate to Jesus. And so how does this look? Well, let's say you've got a teenage daughter and let's say she comes up to you and she says, mom, I'm trying to grow in my relationship with God and, and I wanna learn how to pray. Mommy, how am I supposed to talk to God? I don't know how to pray. And ladies, your response would be, well, sweetie, you know how I talk to dad? You know how I treat dad when he comes home from work? You know how I'm there to comfort him and encourage him and to celebrate him and give him honor? That is how we talk to Jesus. That's how we treat Jesus. And when that's our response and when our lives look so attractive to our children and to the world around us, then the gospel will spread so fast and you don't even have to preach. You just gotta love your spouse well. And so to understand that marriage is more important than we think, we have to turn to scripture. Satan hates marriage because it represents Christ and the church. And Jesus is so frustrated by this question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And we ask a very similar question. I get this question so many times. Pastor Matt, is it a sin if I get divorced? Is it a sin? And here's Jesus's, this must have been his thought. Would it be okay if the, the Trinity divorced? Would that be okay? Have you not read that you represent me and the church? And I know this is a very strong message because it's coming up against the very thing that many of us have been plagued by. And it's a, a very um, delicate situation because I know that many of our hearts have walked through the challenges and the struggles of a hard marriage, of a broken marriage. But can I say this? The word of God is supposed to illuminate inside of us and give us a perspective of what's in the heart of God. And so again, I hope that no one in the room feels any sort of condemnation. That's the last thing I want you to hear. But I do want you to hear God's heart. And I know if you've been divorced, you would never want your kids to go through that. Am I right? 
You would never wish divorce on somebody. And so wouldn't you want them to know God's heart for marriage? And so again, whether you're in a situation where you've been divorced, you're on your second or third marriage, I want you to know that you can get this word inside you and this marriage can reflect Jesus. And that's where this blessing can come. Okay, so I told you uh, uh, I was gonna share a story about Valentine's Day. All right, so I mentioned to you that Jade and I met January 18th, 2011. February 14th, it sealed the deal. I knew she was the one. Now you may be asking, how do you know that she's the one? Well, there's this whole divine backstory. I'm not gonna get into that, but I will tell a funny story. So I was working for the apartment community uh, at our university. We were at Dallas Baptist University. I worked down the hill and I was scrubbing toilets and, uh, and apartment units. I was getting calls from ladies who had too much hair in the shower drain. And she's like, I don't know why my water's not draining. And it was just, it was a bad job, but it, it paid the bills. And so Jade texts me on Valentine's day and she says, hey, when do you get off work? And when, when you're done, can you come up to your dorm room? I wanna see you. I was like, hey, okay. We were just friends at this point, but you know, things were in the works. And so I get off work, I, I walk up the hill and I get ready to enter my dorm room and I see big hearts made out of construction paper taped to my door. And I was like, uh-uh. Oh, okay, Jade, I see what you're doing. So I open my door, I walk in. You guys, this was crazy. There are streamers hanging down from my ceiling fan. There are hearts everywhere. It looked like a girl's dorm, let me just say that. But she decorated this thing so nicely. There were balloons filled up everywhere. You could not walk into the room without popping a balloon. And so I kick some of the balloons out of the way. I turn over and look at my dresser and she has a gift basket for me with all of my favorite snacks. I'm, I'm addicted to chapstick. You guys, let me just say, I've got a chapstick 24 seven. And she gave me a Costco pack of chapstick and beef jerky. She knew, she knew my love language. And so I, I'm just amazed. And she said, well, let me show you something else. And so she walks me outside and we start heading toward my car. Now, let me just tell you, I did not know going to college that I would even be able to get a girlfriend because I had a red, two-door hatchback Ford Focus, a, a, a four-cylinder that got up to about 70 miles per hour. And I didn't know that I would ever be able to pull any lady. But Jade, she was able to excuse the car. She had a nice Mustang and had the hood scoop and she had the better vehicle. But she took my vehicle and she put window paint all over it. She put big hearts and she said, will you be my valentine? Will you be my Valentine? Listen, I know all the ladies, Ah, Let me tell you, Jade was not gonna miss her moment. She was gonna shoot her shot and she was gonna make sure that I and every other person on the campus knew that she wanted me. And so you take a guy who was 14 listening to 90s R&B and you take a young woman who is gonna make sure everybody knows that I am wanted and you put us together and it was just love at first sight. And it was amazing. I love my bride. I love my bride. I asked her if she could be in here and she's like, I gotta be up on, uh, on the second floor, kids ministry. So if you wanna see more of Pastor Jade in the room, then nudge the person next to you and say, you need to serve upstairs in children's ministry so Pastor Jade can be here hearing these funny stories. I love love. All right, point number three, last point for the day. Marriage represents covenant. I mentioned this earlier in the message, marriage represents covenant. Now in the book of Malachi, God is explaining three reasons why he would not accept their offering. And here are the three reasons. He says their faith is out of order, their family is out of order, and their finances are out of order. And on the finances piece, this is where uh, we get some of the principle of putting God first in our finances with tithing. But we're gonna dig into the family being out of order. Malachi 2.14, yet you say, for what reason? I think it's interesting we are reading the same language, this, for this reason. They're saying, for what reason is God not accepting our offerings or our sacrifices? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. 
He's saying, you have not treated your wife well and you wanna sacrifice to me? Translation, guys, when, when, when the Bible tells us to uh, honor our wives and that the way that we treat our, our wives actually affects God hearing our prayers. The same heart is in the Old Testament. Fellas, if you don't treat your wives well, why would God accept your sacrifice? Why would he accept the things that you wanna give him? Why would he answer your prayer when you won't even treat the woman that he gave you well? And so Malachi is accounting that God will not accept their sacrifices because their life is out of order and their family is out of order. And so I wanna talk to you real quick about contract versus covenant. Now a contract maximizes what you can get and protects what you can lose, but a covenant commits to what you'll give and regards the person over the possession. See, often in our culture and in our language, we prioritize contracts. If you're in business, you've, you've written up a contract or you've signed a contract, but the language of scripture is different because we're not trying to protect ourselves when we get into a marriage. Guys, we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loves the church. He gave sacrificially. So we're actually stepping into a marriage, representing covenant, and we're showing what it looks like to be selfless and sacrificial. And I wanna to speak to the single people in the room. And I wanna encourage you of this. Look for someone who is covenant-minded, who is loyal, who is faithful, who is honoring to their parents, who says, uh, who does what they say they're going to do, who is faithful to church, who is faithful to the Lord. Can, can I just say this very directly? You do not wanna get into a marriage and hope that they're gonna be faithful to their covenant. You don't wanna hope. You wanna know by evidence in their life now that their word is their word. And can I say this? I don't put my trust in my marriage being successful in whether or not Jade is gonna stay faithful to me because she's human. You know what I put my trust in? Her faithfulness to God. Because I know that my wife, and we've set our marriage up this way, my wife holds God in higher regard than she holds me. And so when she has problems with me, this is, this is helpful, guys, we want this. She doesn't just go straight to me, she goes to God first. So before she is tempted to cuss me out, she spends time praying and says, Lord, I need some help right now. Matt has lost his mind, he's going crazy, and I wanna say something that's gonna throw some, throw some knives, but Lord, I need your help. And so when God is first, we trust somebody's relationship with God over their commitment to us. And so if you're looking for someone to spend the rest of your lives with, make sure that they have put God first. You do not wanna step into a marriage, single people, with someone who's obsessed with you. If they put you before they put going to church, they put before spending time in the presence of God, that is a red flag. So let me just step out there and say that. Now, if you're with somebody and you're already in a relationship and you're like, man, we're trying to figure it out, there's counseling for that. But I'm saying for the people who are not engaged, not married yet, find somebody who is faithful. All right, married people, your marriage will do more to show people the gospel of Jesus than your words ever can. Parents, if you wanna know the best way to disciple your children, it's to remain committed and faithful to your spouse. You could be tempted to think, how do I get them to memorize all these Bible verses? And how do I get them to uh, prioritize God? Can I just say this? If you will model for them what a covenant looks like, then you don't have to explain it by reading every word of the Bible. They will see it when they look at you. And that's what marriage does for children. When you said, I do, you entered into a covenant. Now, some of you are like, man, I wish I wouldn't have said those words, but here's what you said for rich or for in sickness or in for better or, and some people are saying, man, Pastor Matt, my marriage has just gotten worse. Yeah, you said yes to that. You said I do. And then you took it a step further. Oh, you said till death do us part. And then you're saying, oh, but it's worse. I can't believe we ever got to this place. You knew that. You knew that when you said I do, but let me remind you, 
that you're not in it alone. And maybe your marriage has looked like just you and your spouse. But come on, when you get the power of God, you get an infusion of the Holy Spirit into your marriage, you can have the marriage that you've dreamed of. You can have the marriage that you've seen by those people that you look up to. But you gotta get God in your marriage. The marriage covenant is patterned after the new covenant. You see, in scripture, there are multiple covenants that God makes with mankind, but I wanna show you two. The first one's in the Old Testament, and that's what we call the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant that God communicated to Moses with the Israelite people. So as they're being led out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, God makes a covenant with them. And essentially, he says this, Israel, I will be your father, I will be your protector, I will be your provider, and I will bless you. That's my end of the covenant. Your end, hmm, let me think, is to be perfect. And Israel said, okay, deal. And before Moses uh, uh, even got down from the mountain, they were already breaking the covenant. They were already walking in sin. They had just said yes, and they were already breaking it. Why did God give the Mosaic covenant in the first place? to show them the standard of perfection. But watch this, according to Romans and Galatians, he gave them the Mosaic covenant to actually frustrate them to come to Christ. And if you don't know that they were frustrated, just read Numbers, just read Leviticus, just read Deuteronomy. It is so frustrating to try to be perfect. Can anybody relate? It is frustrating. And they are sinning and they're falling short and all God wants is this, God, I I just can't do it anymore. I just want you, God. I can't be perfect. I don't know how. I just want a relationship. And God is saying, that's all I wanted. God doesn't want a legalistic relationship with us. He just wants our hearts. In the Old Testament, the Mosaic Covenant was to draw the hearts for people to realize that they couldn't be perfect. And maybe some of you in the room today, you're just trying to be a good person. You're trying to be perfect. And yet we all fall short. But this is the covenant that marriage is modeled after, the new covenant. So God is saying, I'll be your father, I'll protect you, I'll provide for you, and I'll bless you. And your job Actually, Jesus, would you come here real quick? Jesus, I want you to meet Matt. And there's no way that he will ever be able to fill, fulfill perfection. Jesus, would you be willing to die for Matt to be in a covenant with us? And Jesus says, I do, I will. And what happened when I was 15 years old was that I recognized that God sent his son And Jesus came onto this earth and lived the perfect life that we should have lived. And he died to pay the consequences that I owed. And at 15 years old, I had the realization that if everybody else in the entire world was perfect, Jesus would have still come for me. And that's why God, uh, that's why Satan hates marriage so much. Because Jesus sacrificially gave. I wanna invite our worship team to come up. Jesus showed us, it doesn't matter if you don't fulfill your end of the covenant, I will. And in marriage, that's our heart. Even if my spouse doesn't fulfill their end of the covenant, I will fulfill mine. I wanna invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. We are telling the world through marriage that we serve a covenant keeping God. And I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know if you're in a season of pain, of grief, of looking at your life that you thought was going to be a certain way. And there's been an interruption. There's been a put on pause. Maybe you're in a marriage right now and you're in a season of crisis. You don't know how tomorrow is even going to 
turn out. And you're saying, I need a blessing. I need a miracle. I need a touch from God. Maybe today you're saying, I don't know that I've ever put my faith in Jesus Christ. I've just been trying to be a good person, better than other people that I may know. And I'm looking to my left and my right to to figure out how I'm supposed to live as a man, how I'm supposed to live as a woman. And you've never said yes to accepting the blood of Jesus the only blood that could make you righteous, the only person who could put you into the covenant with God. And maybe today for you, you're saying, I wanna make that decision today. No matter where you find yourself today, I wanna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? And Lord, we wanna say thank you. Thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you are in the midst of our situation. God, you know what we're walking through. You know the pains, you know the hurts, you know the just trying to make it. But God, we invite you to do what only you can do. Lord, right now I pray over every married couple in the room, whether it's their first marriage or their second or third, God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, an anointing would fall on these marriages. In fact, I wanna do something really quick. If you're married in the room and your spouse is with you, would you stand and just take the hand of your spouse? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I speak a blessing over every marriage that's represented today, whether it's their first or more. God, I speak a blessing. Lord, would the enemy not have any foothold in their marriage? Would every attack of the enemy fall down in the name of Jesus? Would every struggle, would every temptation, would every hurt, would every wound be healed and rebuked in the name of Jesus? God, would a spirit of strength and unity come upon these marriages? God, would you anoint them? Would you give them the boldness and the courage to represent God, to represent Christ in the church and to represent covenant? God, I pray that you would give an influence to these couples to show the body of Christ what marriage looks like, what faithfulness looks like, what commitment looks like. And God, we stand on your word and we will not bow down to the enemy that's wanting to disrupt marriage in our culture. Lord, you instituted marriage from the very beginning. And Lord, there is a blessing that every marriage has waiting for them. So Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you would infuse each of these marriages and the families that they represent with love, with joy, with peace, with hope, with courage, with a willingness to keep going, with a willingness to fight the battle, with a willingness to struggle well, with a willingness and a commitment to go the distance, to see this marriage last all the way through. God, that they would maybe be a fresh breath of air to their families where divorce has been plaguing with generational curses. Maybe they don't even know anyone in their family that's had a successful marriage. God, I pray that you would start with them. And God, for those with children, I pray that a new legacy would be birthed in these parents in the room that as they take a stand for God, as they say, we will stay faithful and we will represent God to the world. God, I pray that these children would come to Christ. God, I pray that these children would know how you love us by these couples love for one another. Lord, I bless them. God, we stand behind these couples and Lord, we will not let them struggle alone. So Lord, whatever is happening, God, would you, touch their marriage. Bring the healing that's needed. Bring the reconciliation that's needed and bring the hope that's needed. In Jesus' name, amen.